Hello, my name is Mike Ailey, and I play bass. I'm about to show you about uh, some of my gear. It's not like I'm teaching a high school class or something. It's not very cool. Anyway, bass guitars. Um, on tour, I have, this tour in particular, I have five with me, because you never know if four of them are going to break. You need a few backups. Um, one that is not shown here is a Rickenbacker. That's one of my most loved basses, but the sound it doesn't quite fit in uh, with what we're doing right now. These all have really hot outputs. Uh, so it's actually better for the front of house sound to have that kind of levels, uh, consistent levels. This is a uh, Fender M Mark Hoppus uh, bass and I love it. It sounds amazing. Um, it's a really, really, really consistent bass. Um, sounds good all the way up the neck. It's affordable too. I mean, if somebody's looking for a first bass that they're going to spend a few bucks on, <coughs> I'd actually recommend this one uh, to almost everybody. Uh, it's about... 700 bucks or so um, but it's so good that like Josh has one in the studio Matt has one for when he's just tracking stuff it's it's that worth having and and affordable okay so here's another bass this is a Thunderbird looks like it's a hundred years old but it's uh, about 12 I think it's a 2003 um, I've modified these pickups to see more Duncan's so it sounds as I was talking about earlier with the output stuff so it's similar to the other things, um, sounds really good and this thing got really, really worked over the first bunch of tours that I took it on and the other ones were just not sounding good anymore anyway. Connections were pretty rough so I got it all all touched up. You'll notice a lot of my bases that I've had for a while have this kind of wear on them. It's from these things, because I'm playing. I love it, it's kind of like a, my signature wear spot. Everybody has their own but... Um, this, this bass comes to me uh, about five, six songs through the show and it's tuned to drop D, um, which means this, this string is actually tuned to D instead of an E. And I use it, uh, start the set with, what's the first song I play with it? Who Do You Love is the first song I play with this, then I play it through Stutter and Fallout. This is the current set list anyway. Um, and then tune it back up for One Love and um, This Means War. These are actually in almost in order of how I, how I use them here. This is <clears throat> my most precious bass. Um, it's a Fender Tele, it's a 68, which means this thing is older than anybody working for us. Um, and it sounds amazing. We use this to track a lot of the album. Um, this song, this was, it was either this bass or we actually borrowed one like this from somebody else when we tracked uh, the album and almost every song was done on it. Uh, for Astoria um, and it sounded so good that I got my own uh, what is it what do you want to know about this I don't know this is this is just is the first year they ever made this bass which kind of makes it a little bit more collectible um, and I am very proud to have it and I didn't know I was gonna love it as much as I did but as soon as you play it live and it sounds better in your ears than anything you've ever played before you're like that's why vintage is so good um, the strings, I don't know if I told you, they're Diderio, they're uh, 45, 105, that's the gauge on them. Um, what do I use this for? This is what I normally was starting the set with for the first five songs, and I definitely close, close with it. Um, it's the bass, the actual bass that uh, recorded End of an Era, so I like to have that exact sound. When we were in Philly a few days ago, I uh, popped into this guitar store just across the road uh, from the venue. And walked in and saw this. This is a 1978 Gibson RD Artist bass, and it is something that I've been looking for for about 10 years. Um, you can find them online, and I I wasn't sure about it, but I um, didn't. Some of them come with a, a wood finish with the black pickguard, and I love the black on black on this. I think it's a really sexy bass, and has a womanly shape about it but a little bit of badass edge to it and it sounds crazy it's got um, this you notice in the back it's got this huge panel here there's a whole bunch of electronics in here it's got like this Moog circuit boards it's kind of weird a little bit finicky so you can have it set to active pickups or passive I do passive because the active are, are really noisy and actually the output is too hot um, I think it sounds better this way anyway but it's really grindy, it's got a ton of grit, um, really dark, but uh, also really consistent levels all the way up and down the neck. And, uh, and I went in the store and I, as long as it wasn't broken, I was like, I knew I was leaving with it. I just had to talk the guy down a couple bucks and pretend I wasn't. Um, 
this may be my new favorite bass. Anyway, um, as far as amplifiers go, believe it or not, I don't use one. I used to have, I still have it actually, um, a huge Ampeg rig, the 8x10 fridge with the the SVT Classic. I actually have the, um, the Heritage one. It's like an anniversary model. It's, it sounds great, but it's so big. You just hauling it every day is a, is a burden. And then I was having it mic'd and it was over in Guitar World and you have to have the mic to pick up the bass frequency so loud that I was getting so much bleed from the guitars that we were doing an arena run. And I was like, like what is going on with my ears? I'm getting so much guitar that I was going deaf very quickly. So um, we tried just using a DI so there's no mic, but the signal's direct, it's a direct input. And now that's all we use. And we've used it for 100, 200 shows like that now. And it sounds really good. No noise, great signal for the front of the house, great in my ears, and it doesn't piss anybody off when I fool around and, and uh, people don't want to hear it. They can just turn off their ears. Um, I think that's it for me. Hey, I'm Josh, and we're going to look at some of my guitars. Um, it's always difficult for me going on tour because uh, I'm an avid collector of guitars, so you know I've got so many that I, I try and bring a different uh, guitar selection per tour. So, this tour, uh, the album that we just did is uh, heavily 80s influenced, so I wanted to get a couple of things that were core 80s collectibles. This is one of my favorites, this is ultra rare American Showster, uh, which, if the battery is on, has a working tail light. Uh, the, the fun thing about this is there are so few of them that the luthier that made them, rather than give it a serial number, actually signs the back and then gives each one a name based on his pets. So this is Kicks. This is a custom original uh, designed by me and uh, my good friend and luthier, uh, Paul Iverson. Paul has built me a few custom guitars over the years and he does an awesome job. It's based on a Gretsch Billy Bow, um, but it is reverse and it is made in the rare wood Carina and obviously has a smashed mirror on there. The, lucky, the great thing about that is that you can kind of check your hair and your makeup while you're on stage. The other magic thing about this is it has an Evertune bridge, which means this guitar will stay in tune forever. Like, forever. This is a Parker Fly. Um, a lot of people seem to think that Parker Flies are cheesy guitars, and in my, in my opinion, they are just guilty by association with some cheesy players. They're really well-made guitars, they're lightweight, um, they sound awesome. This has, uh, I swapped the pickups out of this, and these are uh, original uh, Seth Lover PAFs. Uh, it, also, it also doubles as an acoustic, uh, and I refinished it with some pink splatter, given the whole 80s thing. This guy I got on this tour. Um, there's a really great guitar company called JBD, J. Backland Designs. Uh, it's uh, the combination of an awesome graphic artist and, uh, named J. Backland and a great luthier named Bruce Bennett. Uh, unfortunately, the company went under, so there are less than 40 of each guitar that they made. So it was really hard for me to find this, and I was really, really excited when I found it, and it sounds awesome. This is a Gretsch Billy Bow that I refinished in Checkers in uh, tribute to Cheap Trick guitarist Rick Nielsen. Uh, it sounds awesome and it's a lot of fun to play. Uh, I've been closing the show with it lately uh, and we call it Checkers. This is a mid-1960s Gretsch Astrojet that I picked up from Emerald City Guitars in Seattle while we were on tour. It's one of the stranger, uh, more esoteric of the Gretsch uh, and it's a really unique sounding guitar. Uh, it's got these Supertron pickups, which are not featured in many Gretches, and uh, it's cool. I always liked it. I feel like it looks like someone took an SG and just fucked it up. Uh, it's awesome, and it plays great. Also, in honor of the whole 80s thing, uh, Joy Division, um, this is a Vox Phantom uh, from the mid-60s, uh, and I replaced two of the pickups with these Telenator wide-range pickups. Now, the fun thing about wide-range pickups is they were only ever made for real for a couple of years in the 70s because the magnets that are in them, Kun Fife, are so expensive to make that uh, Fender stopped making them. So if you get wide range pickups now, they're not going to sound very good. They sound like this. However, this one company on the planet still will make real wide range pickups, which is where I got these. They're very expensive, but they fucking sound rock and roll. This guitar. <laughs> 
This is called The Patriot. Um, so, a few years ago, we were playing a Canada Day show, a uh, big festival, and uh, the night before, we were out and about getting up to no good, and walked past a pawn shop, and this thing was sitting in the window for like 90 bucks. So I bought it as a joke, thinking like, oh, that's funny, I'll play it for the Canada Day thing. And it sucked so bad that it only made it through like half a song, but it, you know, it was only for a joke. And then it lived in my Jack in the Box from the Ever After era uh, for like two years. And then for some reason, and then we played another Canada Day show again, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna make this thing work. So I gave it to my good luthier friend, Paul Iverson, and said, do everything you can to it to make it actually work. So now it actually plays, uh, and it sounds not bad. But it's funny, this is the guitar that gets the most reaction out of all of my guitar collection, and it's by far the shittiest guitar I own. <laughs> so here's the way all of my other shit works. So I play through three amps. I play through a two-rock Gain Master for my clean tone. Uh, it's facing away, but I play through a Vox Night Train for my rhythm tone. And then for my heavy tone, again, given the whole 80s thing, I play an EVH. Um, so, then in here we have all my pedals uh, that are all hiding in that rack. And they talk to the computer through this radial switcher. And the radial switcher switches between my amps and my pedals uh, in a programmed order. Uh, that way I never have to have a pedal board on stage. I can just focus on playing a good show and all of my shit will switch on its own. And then also, to eliminate stage volume, we don't use any uh, guitar cabinets uh, for control. We use <sighs> these radial head loads, uh, which are amazing. It replaces the need for a speaker cabinet, and we used it on the album, uh, and now we use them live. So we have no stage volume whatsoever except for drums. So I run everything through a script logo Dynacomp that uh, just smooths out my playing and any gain differences between the guitars. Um, I use a Klon Overdrive pedal, uh, which is super badass. Uh, a Soul Food is a clean boost. Strymon is a fantastic chorus pedal. Uh, uh, I, <laughs> I use the flashback for delays. I use this really awesome pedal called the Afterneath that is a just crazy, echoey, monstrous, epic sounding, really cool effect. Very vibey. And then also sort of in the same vein as the Afterneath is the uh, Gold Modified Eterna, which uh, kind of gives you a echo delay up an octave. So it so sort of sounds like a whammy pedal through a reverb or something like that. It's really cool. And then the most important thing to make the whole thing work is that guy Royce right there. <laughs> Hi. Royce built all of this and uh, is in control of it every night. And the whole rig would not work without Royce. <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Matt Webb and I play guitar. Uh, let me show you some of my stuff. Uh, where to start? This baby right here. This is a uh, Gibson Firebird. Um, it was a custom shop uh, limited run. I think it's like, you know, there's about 400 of these made. And uh, it's cool because it's got maple wings on it, which is kind of unusual for a Firebird. Sounds really cool. Classic mini humbuckers in here. Um, I tuned this guy up. Uh, uh, the whole tone, uh, the whole guitar, and I use it for the opening and closing track, uh, which would be Astoria and Anna Manera in our set. Uh, next on the list, we have, I like to call this guitar the Tavacaster. Uh, this guitar was built by my friend Tavish Crow, and he is the guitar player for Carly, Carly Rae Jepsen, and he also helped uh, to co-write Call Me Maybe as well. Um, I wanted this guitar to be a combination of a non-reverse uh, Gibson Firebird body with a Fender Telecaster neck, and it's got a uh, uh, mini humbucker in the in the neck and a uh, what is this? It's just a Lawler Tele pickup in the in the bridge there, and uh, and of course the little Gibson Firebird logo because I love that so much. Uh, this thing sounds great. It's really like nice and bitey, and I use it for. Uh, I play it on Burning Up and All to Myself and songs where I need the, the guitar sound to be really like tight and spanky. Oh, this is uh, oh, it's one of my prized possessions. This is a uh, 1972 Fender Telecaster Thin Line. It's all original. It's the same guitar that the guy from Coldplay uses. Um, I know Josh was talking a little bit earlier about the wide range pickups, but these were, uh, that's what these things are right here. Very, very great special sound to them. Um, this guitar is actually serial dated the uh, end of 1971, so it would have been the 
like part of the very first run of these guitars, uh, which is which is awesome. And it's black, original finish, not a scratch on it except for all the belt rash that I put on it. But they're born to be rocked. Love it. This guy here, um, this is called a. Uh, uh, it's sorry, it's a Duesenberg Star Player, and it's got this wicked sparkle, black sparkle finish on it, which I really really love. Um, the late Glenn Fry. Uh, called these Duesenbergs the Cadillac of new guitars, and they, they truly are. They're, they're the most, like, just so well manufactured, they can take an absolute beating. This guitar's been smashed around more than you can believe, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it survives like no other. It's, it sounds great, plays in tune, it intonates beautifully, and it's uh, just a, a tr really treat to play. I, uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of Duesenberg stuff. I've got like four or five of them at home. And uh, continue to own them forever. I, in fact, I'm I'm so confident in these guitars that I, I would say that in like you know 50 or 60 years, these will all be worth a, just a ton of cash, like you know the old Gibsons and, uh, and Fenders are of the 60s, just because they're so well built and, and there's really nothing like them out there. Um, I use uh, I use the Dario strings. Uh, my gauges are um, usually like 10 to 50s, I think. Um, I do have one guitar with an Evertune bridge on it, this guy, and that requires a slightly lighter gauge of string, but um, yeah, usually just 10s, 11s. I'm not too picky with my string size, but uh, to Dario makes good stuff. So this is my rig. It's brand spanking new. I love it. Uh, Royce and Randall built it for me. Um, I use a combination of two different guitar heads. Uh, here we have a 65 amp Soho. It's a, uh, I believe an 18 water, and it is rad. I use this for my clean sound. And below we have what's called a divided by 13 RSA 23. It's a 23 watt two channel head. Um, this thing is so goddamn ballsy and loud. It's uh, it's my favorite amp in the world. I just love it. Made by a little boutique manufacturer out of California. Um, and then uh, this is all just wireless stuff up here. Uh, Radial JX44. It's the uh, just the switcher that I use to switch between guitars. Um, this is Rack Gizmo. This is all my, my pedal board stuff here. Um, Josh kind of gave, probably gave you the load on, on how our, all our stuff works, but basically uh, I don't do any switching on stage. Royce, that guy over there, handles, handles all my guitar tone changes, um, and it's all just from, from here, which is very convenient for me and very inconvenient for him. <laughs> um, pedals, I'm a huge fan of um, the Empress brand. They're manufactured in Ottawa, in Canada. I've got a compressor. I've got a tremolo and I've got a tap delay um, that's uh, are rad. Actually, sorry, tape delay, but it's a tap tempo. Uh, Boss chorus pedal, classic 80s pedal, Voodoo Lab sparkle drive, and then there's a uh, just a Boss equalizer in there, which I use in burning up in the uh, in the bridge to make that sort of fine young cannibal tone. Um, and then below that, we've just got a couple of radial head loads. These are just uh, cabinet simulators and. Um, Attenuators for amp, so we don't use any any cabs on stage. There's zero stage volume. All the uh, guitar stuff runs into these beauties, and then they it feeds out to the board and into our ears and into the front of the house. And uh, they're a great, great tool because it keeps everybody's hearing in check and uh, and emulates or simulates the sound of a live cabinet and does a really, really good job at it. So highly recommend radial headloads. They're beautiful, used by Sting and all kinds of big performers all over the world. Oh, and lastly. And most importantly, we have Roadcase Panda. He just sits up and just watches me play every night. I'm Ian, drumming for Mariana's Trench, and you're actually going to the center stage, the most important part of the stage. Come with me. I am a Yamaha guy through and through. I like them because I think they sound fantastic. They're super worth the price. They're really easy to tune, and they tune very consistent. So if you're doing a lot of backline stuff, Yamaha is the easiest kits to rent, um, and also they tune all like all the same because all their hardware is the same. So apart from the actual drum tuning part, all the drum hardware is interchangeable. So they're very very easy to set up, very very easy to tune. This is a Maple Hybrid kit. Uh, I like the 20 inch bass drum because it's a little bit punchier. So you know, like 20 is ideal for us. 20 and 22 are probably the most common. Uh, I'm a Remo guy for heads. I like them because they last the longest. I find they're also easy to tune, and you can never over-tune them once, like, once you stretch them. If you tune them up really high, you can detune them and they will not lose their elasticity, whereas a lot of other head companies, if you tune them too, too high, they have a different type of mylar system, so what happens is when you back it off, it loses all of its tone, so it sounds like wet cardboard. 
Uh, so I love Remo. I love Vic Firth. Uh, I find they're fantastic sticks. They're super, they're weighted very well. They're really, really consistent. They have really, really high quality control. So they don't have very many duds when you get them. If you're ordering, you know, in a brick packs of 12, they're, they're uh, very, very few duds. Uh, continuing back, sorry, with Yamaha, I should mention I have a DTX kit as well. They are absolutely insane. I can't tell you how good they are and how versatile they are. You can do, I probably know how to use 3% of their capability. They're, it's crazy what you can do. You can load up samples. So if you did an album where you wanted to import specific samples, you can import all the samples. Um, it's insane. It's crazy. It's absolutely insane. Electronic kick drum too. I got like a sleigh pedal. So you see how this is a regular pedal here. This was a double pedal. So if I'm hitting this one, it uh, use the sleigh pedal to, uh, to hit the electronic kit. Um, but it's insane. Yeah, it's insane what you can do. Um, last but not least, I love Sabian cymbals. I find they're amazing. I rarely, rarely, rarely ever crack them. Um, they just sound phenomenal. They're super crisp. They're super. They're super tight sounding, so they're not ringing over everything. Um, they don't have any, like a lot of them have the weird, harm, like they ring obviously, but not the weird harmonics. Sometimes with cymbals you get a real, real low hum that is riding in the, uh, in the microphones. You don't get that much. And for you lucky Americans, you're very fortunate because Sabian's made in Canada. So you can get wicked cymbals and you could save basically 30% off the price because our dollar sucks ass. So Sabian is a very economical deal for you. Um, as far as microphones, our whole band were endorsed by Sennheiser and Neumann. So Sennheiser everywhere, Neumann everywhere on all our guitar stuff, all the guitar rigs, Sennheiser vocal, all our vocal stuff is uh, vocal mics out front there, Sennheiser, all our wireless gear, Sennheiser. We like them because they're very, very durable and consistent, hard to break when you are doing a lot of touring life, you know. I try not to hit the microphones, I should be hitting the drums, but it happens the odd time. Uh, and the odd time Josh likes to, you know, the odd mic drop, whoosh, Sennheiser can withstand a few falls, so we're very happy to be using those guys. Yeah.